I am Margaret with BGI Worldwide Logistics. We are a freight forwarder here in Southern California, headquartered in Long Beach, but I work with our satellite, work on our satellite office out of Palm Desert, um, which meant I left my house about 6.30 <laughs> this morning and still didn't get here on time. All right, so again, we are a freight forwarder and the main role of freight forwarding is to coordinate the movement of your product. We determine the, the best, most effective and safe way to move your product based on what your current expectations are. Um, you're shipping to a company, let's say in China, you know, you've got a 200 pound box, but you know, you don't want to spend a lot of money. We, we look at that box and we look at your options. We look at ocean, we look at air, we look at consolidated air. We also take a look at the value and the commodity and recommend the best choice for how your product can get there on time and safely in, and in the most cost-effective manner. Um, again, doesn't always mean cheapest, it means most cost-effective. There's a lot of cheap ways to doing things, but when your product ends up damaged more times than not, it's really not cost effective in the long run. So, As a freight forwarder, we look, at, like I said, at all different modes of transportation. Each shipment is unique and how we choose to move it to its destination, the routing as we call it, is unique. Um, we can utilize ocean, air, over the road or rail, and many times we're actually using a combination of these modes of transportation. Um, as an example, I have a customer that is shipping to Bolivia, which is an interior country. We are going to rail the product from the, from the middle of the US to the port. We're then going to move it ocean to a port in Chile, and then from Chile, it's gonna go over the road to the final destination in Bolivia. As a freight forwarder, it's our job to figure out all of that not yours you just let us know what you need and again we work on the routing to get you there um, okay these are a lot of the different services that freight forwarders do um, again we do a, a lot more than just move boxes you know we do the inland freight as i mentioned the various modes of transportation we also do cargo consolidation um, consolidation and direct shipments we can, uh, we prepare documents for the carriers. We can also assist you in preparing your documents. Sometimes there's banking coordination when it involves customs. Um, we can also offer sh insurance in many, many cases. Um, insurance, we'll talk about a little bit more because where it's going and your product does have an effect on that. Um, forwarders, we can also offer packaging and again, consolidating and warehousing. Um, we can assist with the export and import of custom clearance. Um, a lot of people don't realize that um, when something moves internationally, you were dealing with customs on both sides, not just in its destination country. Um, we can assist with the duty and tax payments, um, both here in the U.S. if it's something being imported or in the destination country if that is part of your sales agreement to take responsibility for those charges. Um, we can issue resolution, um, collect payments, and general customs inquiries. Um, we can also share our market research. Um, that includes our data and the information that we've gathered along the way. So um, as mentioned earlier, you know, with tariffs and trade agreements constantly changing, this information is constantly changing. It is our job to stay on top of that. And as your trusted service provider, to advise you when things are changing. One of the things my office has done a lot this year is sending out notices to our customers as tariffs change. Um, seems like we send out a notice and a week later we're sending out another notice, but th that's our job. And not only is it our job to pass that information to you, but to pass that information to you in a way that is understandable for somebody who doesn't live within this world 24 seven. 3PL services, 3PL stands for third party logistics. Um, that's what a freight forwarder is many times. You have got the first party, the seller, the second party, the buyer. The person in the middle, us freight forwarders, were the third party, so third party logistics. Um, things that uh, third party logistics will have is a warehouse. We have um, 
loading docks so we can safely receive containers, trucks, whatever is needed. We have got the necessary racking and storage, the forklifts, the pallets. A lot of times when freight comes into the U.S., it comes in on pallets that are toast. There are more toothpicks than pallets, so we can swap those things out. We have technology systems that involves our inventory management. Um, so if you bring in a container, you don't have your own warehouse, you can utilize ours as you sell your product one pallet at a time, we ship it out. We keep an inventory record of that, so you always know what is in our system. We can also set that up um, so that we alert you when you're to a certain low level knowing it's time to reorder. And by when I say we, I don't necessarily mean just BGI, but all quality forwarders out there should be able to offer these services to you. Um, picking and packing, this is becoming more and more common, um, not so much on exporting per se, but on importing as Amazons, Ebays, the Walmarts of the world are taking over. Um, makes good sense to purchase a large quantity from a ma manufacturer outside of the US store it here and then as you sell it we pull your items out of the warehouse and consolidate them into a box and ship it to your end user very common like you go to amazon and you've bought five different items they wait and put them all in one box and ship it so that's the consolidating um, and again transportation um, we work with owner operator carriers as well as large um, carriers so again customized to whatever the unique need is. Insurance, um, again, we offer that. It stays insured while it's under our warehouse. Um, in this case, coverage for structures, inventory, and services. You know, crazy thing, roof collapse after a big wear storm, our insurance is gonna protect your product. Okay. Key factors when choosing a method of transportation, this is, um, little background on how a freight forwarder or an operations person in a freight forwarder is thinking as um, you reach out to us for your request. We look at the product and the size being shipped. We look at the timeline when you need it to get there. Um, your buyer's requirements. Um, they may have some limitations on the size of the pallets they can receive, how much product they can receive at one time, what kind of warehousing and storage may be needed, country of origin very particular just because you are exporting out of the u.s does not automatically make the u.s your country of origin it depends on where your individual components and your raw, raw materials originated from um, duties tariffs taxes quotas again our broker in our office can help with all these things as well as answering questions um, requirements imposed by government agencies and requirements from the bank or your insuring institutions um, Again, we offer insurance. Um, say you're shipping glass baubles, okay? You come and you wanna ship a cardboard box of glass baubles. Our insurance is gonna come back and say, we'll insure this, but not in a cardboard box. You need to have a wooden crate built with foam insulation inside to protect it. Um, these are all the things that we're gonna help you with. Um, again, we, payment terms and INCO terms. I am not gonna go to, into INCO terms in any detail this time just because they recently changed. First time we've had a change in I believe 10 years. Um, my company, we haven't come out with our new flyer yet and to be honest, I haven't fully wrapped my head around the changes yet. But INCO terms basically determine when ownership and responsibility for the shipment changes hands. So when you're exporting out of the US, when does ownership change? When it departs the US, um, when it's in the middle of the ocean, when it arrives at its destination port. Ownership can change hands in many different places. That changes the responsibility on who's responsible for insurance and paying certain fees. Um, again, that's a, a complex subject and we can talk about that offline and I've also got my business cards for anybody who wants um, to know more about it later. All right. Freight forwarding oversight. Um, Interesting, there is a lot of regulations when it comes to moving product, whether domestically or internationally. All quality freight forwarders, you're gonna see not just these, but a whole lot of little symbols at the bottom of our email taglines. I'm pretty sure my email tagline is about a half a page long now. Um, but we are regulated not only by the um, 
Federal Aviation Administration, um, again, the, the International Air Transportation Association, or IATA as it's referred to. Um, the government, we have got CTPAT, we have got the Maritime Commission, a ton of things that we are required to be in compliance with. Each division has a very complex set of rules and guidelines that we need to be in compliant with, not just when moving freight, but documentation, storing information, things like that. Any forwarder that you choose to work with, it's always good to make sure that they have all these various symbols. If, if you have them, then you know that they are in compliance and you're with a trusted company. Um, Non-vessel, um, our NVOCC, the Non-Vessel Operating Common Carrier, my company, we happen to be one. It's an interesting term because you think of a common carrier would be like a steamship line. Indirectly, we kind of sort of are, except we don't own a steamship. What we do is we buy space on the steamship, but this allows us to issue the bill of ladings, um, but we don't actually move the cargo, the steamship line does. This simplifies some paperwork, some costs, and some time. Um, again, a little bit here on INCO terms. Again, it determines which party will be responsible for the transportation of the shipment, determines which uh, party will be responsible for the insuring of the shipment, and it also helps calculate the cost when it arrives at destination. Okay, some basic logistics terminology. Um, like most businesses, we work off a lot of different acronyms. Um, acronyms can mean one thing in freight and mean something else in a whole other industry, but here are some basic ones. Pallet, basically the structure in which you're um, putting your boxes on. An LTL shipment, it means less than a truckload. You know, you're shipping one or two pallets to your buyer. That would be a less than truckload, or if it was going over the water, going ocean, we would call it LCL or less than container load. Um, if you're moving a large quantity, um, typically 22 pallets, uh, standard 4840s fill up a semi-truck. That would be considered a full truckload move. Um, also same with ocean, full container. Most of the time, if you were filling up more than half of the space of the truck or the container, you're already paying for a full truckload or a full container rate. Um, direct consignments, um, that allows us to move product directly to your end user as opposed to having to stop at yet another um, warehouse who's gonna do that final mile. Um, consolidated shipments, forwarders, we do this for ourselves and also for our customers. Um, a common lane is say Los Angeles to New York. Um, you ship your 200 pound box, I'm going to go buy space for 200 pounds, probably going to pay a premium because it's such a small order, but I have got six other customers who are shipping to New York this week as well. If I combine all of those shipments together, it increases my buying power with the carrier and we're able to pass those savings on to our customers. So it's benefit for both of us. Um, also, larger orders tend to not get lost, whereas smaller orders, can, that can happen to them sometimes. Um, we can also do this in consolidating if, say, you have four or five different suppliers you're, and you want, you've bought something from each of those suppliers, but you want them all to deliver to your one customer. Um, a service for this we can do is we can have all of those items shipped into our dock we then package and palletize it and then move it to your customer as one large shipment. They don't have to sit around and wait for UPS to show up five or six times, and hopefully they show up five or six times. Um, gross weight versus net weight. This is kind of interesting. The carriers look charge not just based on the weight of your shipment, but the amount of space that it takes up. Um, sometimes that's referred to as dimensional weight. An example that I like to give to explain this is popcorn. You have a 10 pound box of popcorn kernels. It's maybe about this size. You know, again, weighs 10 pounds, very little space, not gonna cost you very much. You pop that popcorn before you ship it. The weight has not changed, but this little box just became this big box of pop popcorn. 
the carrier's looking at that and saying, you know, but you're taking up the space of this many boxes of unpopped popcorn. So they're going to charge you based on the greater of the actual weight or the dimensional weight. Um, here's some standard terminology that we use. Um, this also gives you an idea on how best you may want to um, ship your product. So when it comes to ocean containers, we see those on the road all the time. A 20 foot holds about um, 10 pallets or 33 cubic meters. Um, a 40 foot container holds again about 20 pallets. A high cube is a little bit taller. The high cubes allow you to double stack pallets inside or ship something that is a little bit taller. Um, a 45 foot container holds about 22 pallets. Don't see quite as many of the 45s as we used to. It seems to be pretty much 40s are the standard and the most common. Um, and related terminology when it comes to um, containers. Standard, that's just your metal box container. Refrigerated, um, there, are, there are ocean containers that have a refrigerator unit built in. Um, a lot of our produce growers utilize those when shipping apples or other um, commodities out, outside of the U.S. Open top, kind of self-explanatory. Your typical, you know, metal shipping container, it just doesn't have a top on it. It's wonderful if you need to um, load heavy equipment or something that isn't going to easily fit through that door. Um, again, when you're working on an open top, you typically still cannot exceed the height of the wall of the container. Um, if you have a piece that does exceed that height, then we go looking at um, what's called a flat rack. Best way to describe a flat rack is a really, really big stainless steel cookie sheet. <laughs> um, and then seals. This is very important. Um, once you have loaded the container, you can seal and lock that container. The seal has a unique identifier number on it. When your customer receives it at the other end, um, you have in advance given them that seal number. So when it arrives, they can look, nope, the seal's not broken, number matches. They know that that container has not been interfered with while in transit. Again, keep in mind, Customs and TSA have the right to break a seal at any time. If they do, they will typically put their own tape on it so you know who it was that did that. Um, even things exporting this country, sometimes customs will inspect prior to it departing the U.S. So even though you've sealed it at your location, that seal's already been broke before it is left here. But again, we're going to know that that has happened and we'll be notifying you that that has happened so you know what is going on with your product at all times. Measurements. Um, we do work, uh, when it comes to international freight, we do work in centimeters in the metric system. Um, metric tons, short tons, kilograms, um, cubic meters. I tell you, at the end of the day, you don't need to know this. Just tell us what you're using. You know, if it's inches or centimeters, we will do all the converting for you. So, uh, ocean freight. Here we go. Ocean freight typically is your least expensive way of moving freight um, internationally. It is also going to be your slowest way of moving freight. Depending on where you are going, it can be anywhere from 14 up to 70 days. Um, I did a shipment um, recently to Sierra Leone, and I believe we're into day 45 now, and it's still on the water and not expected to hit port for another two weeks. Um, some, some countries, if they don't receive a lot of freight, um, the ships don't sail there directly. They will actually hit port in another country and your container will change ships and have to wait for the next sailing to its final miles. Again, those are things that um, your forwarder should be letting you know. You may or may not like that idea. Sometimes there are other carriers that can move it a little faster over the water, but at a higher price. So again, that's a conversation you'll always have with your forwarder to make sure that you are making the informed decision that you need to make. Um, again, we can move freight either as less than a container load or a full container load. Um, definitely a reduced cost for hazardous materials. Many hazardous items cannot go in the air. There are also some hazardous items that can't go over the water but can go in the air. Um, Again, your forwarder is going to ask for the hazardous documentation. 
we're going to look at what it is and determine if it can move the way that you would prefer it to be moved. If it cannot, then we offer solutions. Um, so um, transshipment, that's a little bit about what I talked about with um, your, your container may have to change ships. It may not ride on the same ship all the way to destination depending on where it is going. Um, LCL is definitely going to have a higher risk of damage. LCL is like consolidating. Um, what the ocean carrier is going to do is you've got three pallets, they're going to put it in a container with five or six other shippers' pallets. Those shippers may or may not have shrunk wrapped their pallets well enough, meaning that their product may fall over while in transit. If it falls over onto yours, there can be some damage. Um, LCL shipments, typically those containers are not sealed. Um, they're going to be in a consolidator's warehouse on both ends, so there's going to be a lot of movement of your product, as well as a lot of different hands touching it. <coughs> Pilferage, you know, we talk about it. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. A lot depends on where you're going. Some countries do seem to have a higher percentage of pilfering than others. Um, again, FCL is certainly the most secure way of moving your product. Um, as you can put locks and your seals on it. Again, ocean is definitely a cost-effective way, but what your product is does matter. Um, again, something super fragile, ocean's probably not the safest way to move it. If you have a hi highly calibrated machine part, um, probably want to look at a different option. You have to think about it. Um, your container, when it goes down to the port, First thing that's going to happen to it is some straps are going to be wrapped around it and a crane is going to lift it up. You know, quite a bit, that container is going to sway as it's moving onto the ship. It's going to go thunk on the ship. So it's going to have some hardcore handling to it. Um, air freight. Um, obviously, super quick transit. Um, domestically, um, we can get freight to pretty much anywhere in the U.S. Um, overnight, in some cases, even same day. You know, you, you have something here in LA that you need delivered into Seattle tonight. If you call by 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, we can probably get that accomplished for you. Um, you do have space limitations. Obviously, um, commercial airlines like Delta, American, th their first priority is their passengers and their passengers' luggage. Um, so if they have an excessive amount of passenger luggage, they will actually remove cargo from their ship or from their plane to make room for more luggage. Um, here you are gonna pay uh, certainly a higher cost, um, but your cost based on your action or volume weight, again, that dimensional weight we talked about is greater. When it comes to dimensional weight, different types of carriers calculate that differently. Um, if something's going over the road or over the water, um, the formula for determining your dimensional weight is a little gentler than the formula that they use to determine your air rate. Um, again, air freight is very necessary in the supply chain. It's ideal for perishable items, things that are time sensitive, fragile, or very high value. Um, also good for um, really small things like documents, um, you know, CDs, things like that. They're, they're really small. Your ocean carriers, your ground carriers, their minimums are pretty high. So a lot of times on small, like your little 20 pound box, it can actually be less expensive to go air than over the road. Um, you also have a better secured um, chain of custody. You know, we have the Department of Homeland Security. We also have the TSA involved. Um, TSA is very active in the moving of cargo. Um, we're all familiar with them at the airports and the really long lines. <laughs> um, but they are very active with freight forwarders. Um, we, we encounter what are called random inspections by TSA constantly. They just walk in one day and say, show us all your files. We have to prove that we are compliant at all times. They also are testing the security of our building. Common practice, and I've actually seen it happen, a TSA person comes out of uniform and will actually try to break into your building. They will go to check that your windows are locked. Um, they will rattle your doors, wanting to make sure you are secure. 
If you are a forwarder that has um, cartage or if you're a cartage company that is um, TSA approved, they will actually follow the drivers around while they're on the route without the driver knowing to make sure he's not leaving his doors unlocked while he's running in to make a quick delivery or a quick pickup, making sure that the only people in that vehicle are TSA approved drivers. So, you know, can't bring his kid with him that day, doesn't get to do that. So U.S. exports and product classifications. Um, this is where having a good customs broker as well as a good lawyer comes in very handy. The classification, sometimes referred to as your Schedule B number, basically determines what kind of duty is going to be owed at destination, whether the destination is a foreign country or here in the U.S. Um, there are some websites that you can go to to help you determine these. It's the one area that as a freight forwarder, I can't determine the classification for you. I can help you navigate the websites for you to, turn, to determine it to yourself, or I can refer you to a customs broker or somebody who is authorized to help you with those things. Um, it can be complex because they look at not only what you're shipping or what you are exporting or importing, but what it is made of and how it is used. Um, you know, common, you, you may have, say, a, a gear. If that gear is meant for the automotive industry, it's going to have one code. If it's meant for aerospace, it's going to have a different code, and your duty can be vastly different depending on how that product's going to be used. Um, it also helps to create a more unified description um, of things. And we use this on your export um, declaration, and again, also required on anything coming into the country. All right. So here, here is an example of if you were to go to a website and you were trying to ship something. So in this case, somebody is trying to ship pepper. Um, it's going to ask you, you know, is it black or white versus, you know, red pepper, pink pepper? Is it crushed or not crushed? Um, all of these will send, send you through the tree to get you to your final Schedule B code. Okay. As you see, these codes are issued and maintained by the U.S. Census Bureau, so they're very consistent, um, and they are enforced by U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. Most brokers, that's one of the first things they do is go and check your Schedule B number and make sure that that matches the description of the item that you're shipping. If it doesn't, you're going to get a call and we're going to revisit some paperwork until we know we are compliant. Okay. Security initiatives. We talked earlier a little bit about um, CTPAT, the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. Um, the ISF and your pre-filing requirements. Again, we've talked about Department of Homeland Security and um, the Transportation Security Administration, the TSA. And we also have the Air Cargo Standard Security <laughs> Program. Again, more little things at the bottom of my tagline. Okay. Marine insurance. It is called marine insurance, but it is actually cargo insurance. It is not strictly for moving something over the water. We use marine insurance when something is flying or um, going over the road or even rail. Um, this is very, very good. You're, when you purchase insurance, you are not just purchasing it for the value of the product, but the cost of your shipping as well. Obviously, if something arrives damaged, it's good that you're compensated for the cost of your product, but you also need to be compensated for the cost of moving your product, which can be quite expensive sometimes. <coughs> this starts just kind of a basic coverage here. Um, here under land is kind of interesting because this talks more about LTL carriers. Um, we see those sometimes, y YRC, Roadrunner, these are LTL carriers they assign a class to your product. That class is what determines how much money you get back if there is damage versus insuring it for its full value. So make sure when you are choosing, working with a carrier, especially going over the road, that you know what kind of coverage you have and how much you are gonna be compensated for. Um, again, here we talk about, we, we purchase it with the cost of the product plus the freight um, that makes sure that you are fully covered. Um, again, there are some formulas involved, but none that you ever have to worry about. That's what your forwarder does. 
every forwarder works with a different insurance company and so the insurance rates from one to another may be slightly different um, but overall we're very similar um, exporting documents the these are what can be very important it can create quite a nightmare destination <sighs> if these are not done correctly you have your commercial invoice basically that's your bill of sale um, it has your sales price to your buyer the description of your items and some other information we use that commercial invoice for creating our documents we have to create our own internal bill of ladings for the carriers as well as tra transmit documents to the receiving broker at destination um, all of the information for your shipment we are going to take off of that commercial invoice if we get a a customer's bill of lading that is different from the commercial invoice we're going to stop and talk until we get those two pieces of paper in line with each other your certificate of origin this is really important um, all freight leaving the country is going to need that certificate of origin depending on what country you're going to it may even require a stamp from the chamber of commerce your forwarder should be able to get that stamp for you but again, so when they're talking origin, they are not necessarily meaning what country the product was sold from, but where it was actually manufactured or where the materials came from. So as you as a seller, you may have to do a little bit of background in that I had a um, potential customer reach out during the summer when the trade war was really awful and they wanted to start importing products from Mexico because with NAFTA, duty-free, everything's wonderful. I had to question them a little bit, found out that the company in Mexico is not a manufacturer, is actually just a supplier. The mirrors that they wanted to start moving actually were manufactured in China. Just because they were buying them from Mexico doesn't get them out of the tariff responsibility. Again, that's gonna go back to the true origin of manufacture in that. Um, your export declaration. Basically, this is just saying what you're doing. Um, and your import and export declaration. Again, um, very similar commercial invoice, bill of lading, certificate of origin. There's a few other documents involved here, like your packing slip and stuff. The most important thing is that there is consistency. What you are saying you are shipping in your commercial invoice needs to match what is on your bill of lading, needs to match which is on your certificate of origin. So on. Okay. Required document information. Again, the nature of the product being shipped, what is it? Um, you, you want to ba bring that down in generic terms, not necessarily what your trademark name is for your product. Um, the exporter who is shipping it and the importer who is going to receive it. Um, what government requirements there are depending on the country it's leaving as well as the country that it is going to. The political and economic relationship between the government of the exporters and Im importers. There are what are referred to as embargo countries where we are not allowed to move product. Uh, we cannot ship your cargo to Cuba, um, to North Korea, um, things like that. We cannot move it if we know that that is its ultimate destination and you're trying to move it into another country who has more friendly relations so and again the payment terms um, who's responsible for paying what and when they need to pay it by a lot of times I'd say especially if you're going to do international shipping you want some payment up front you don't want to wait until they receive the product um, there are a lot of additional fees if they don't pay you and then you can't pay your forwarder and so forth. So I do encourage, um, especially when starting out, that you get um, payment or at least partial payment up front. Um, document consistencies. Again, as we discussed, the information on document A needs to be the same as what's on B and C. Um, here's some basic information. The name and address of the shipper. This is the legal business name. If you go as a DBA, you need to have that spelled out correctly. Um, the name and address of your buyer, also referred to as your consignee. Um, the issuer's name, the description of the goods, the quantities, the units. Um, very important to know on your documentation how many pallets you are moving, how many boxes are on those pallets, and the weight and dimension. Um, I have an example of a customer 
who was trying to ship a full container to Australia for a trade show. Very date specific um, when you're shipping to a trade show. Didn't help he wasn't pre-planning very well to begin with, but his container leaving the country actually got stopped by U.S. Customs here. Um, they decided that they wanted to do a random inspection and open the container. His documents showed the information, the number of boxes and stuff, but he had wrapped his product so thoroughly with foam and all these other things to keep it safe that customs couldn't just look at it and go, okay, yep, there's 20 boxes, da, da, da. He then got moved over to an extensive exam, which took three weeks, where customs then pulled everything out of the container, opened everything up, and literally hand counted piece by piece. So again, good quality information here at the beginning is going to save you a lot of headache later. Sadly, our customer ended up missing the trade show. Because of this, he suffered a penalty of, I believe, $10,000 from the trade show for, by not having his product there. He also incurred about $3,000 of custom exam fees. And in the end, his product never actually left the US. So, um, Commercial invoice. This is issued by the exporter um, slash seller of the goods. It is considered your bill of sale, as we discussed. Um, and these are all of the different people who are gonna use that document to determine what is owed and who is responsible for what. Typically on your, also, on your commercial invoice, you're also going to declare who, um, oh, I just had one of those moments. I'll get back to that. <laughs> oh, happens more and more after a certain age, I will tell you that. Um, so. And your packing list, again, this needs to have piece count, weight, and dimensions. Again, needs to match what is on all of the other documents. These are the documents us as a forwarder are going to use in creating the documents for the carrier. The information we put on our documents is only as good as the information you provide. And the shipper's letter of instruction. Um, a lot of customers complain because this is redundant. You filling out one more form that asks the same questions as the last five forms that you filled out but they all have various purposes. The shipper's letter of instructions um, does flag us when we need to know if an export license is required. Most of the time products don't, but once you hit over, um, when you have one Schedule B number um, with a value of more than $2,500, then some automated filing has to happen, as well as verifying the need for export licenses and stuff. So. This one document is another one required. Again, I know it gets to feel redundant that you're doing the same thing over and over again. There's a lot of great software out there, though, that will help you where you get to only enter the information once and it puts it on multiple documents for you. Um, again, this talks about the reason for filing the AES. Um, again, all export shipments valued over $2,500 per individual Schedule B number. Um, so that, that's a clear thing. I have a customer who ships set designs around the world. She will be shipping 50 or 60 different unique items in one shipment. So I've got 50 or 60 Schedule B numbers. Total value of her shipment is about $30,000, but with so many different Schedule B numbers, not one unique Schedule B number actually has a value over 2,500. So she doesn't have to do her SLI. DG transport documents, dangerous goods, hazardous materials. Most likely if you are a manufacturer or shipper of that, you are already very compliant. Um, when it comes to the hazardous, you've got a hazmat certified person on site who properly prepares your documents for transportation. Um, first thing I do is ask for a copy of the MSDS, the uh, material safety data sheet so that I can identify the magic hazmat codes, the UN number, the class and packaging group. I then have um, our hazmat certified person at our location look it over and advise me if there's anything I need to be aware of. I actually have a shipment uh, or a quote in process right now, customers shipping um, four different hazmat items on one pallet going over the water. 
when I looked at all the MSDSs, I did notice that one of them um, was marked as a marine hazard. Um, that raised a flag to me. I've now gone back to my customer, needing him to tell me more about that particular item. What's the total volume? How is it packaged? How many boxes do you have? And then once I have that information, I'll go directly to the ocean carrier and have the conversation to make sure it is safe to move over the water. Uh, please note though, carriers do have the right to refuse an item, even if it is deemed acceptable to move over the water, an ocean carrier can just say, we don't want it anyway. So part of the job as a forwarder is to have those conversations with the carrier so that we can advise you how it can move. And legalized documents, look at that, more documents. <laughs> yes, that is a lot of what we do is paperwork. This idea of a paperless society probably is not gonna happen in the freight forwarding world <laughs> anytime soon. Um, again, here we talk about some other documents that may be issued um, by various countries, um, how it affects payment, also when it comes to controlling the import of documents the control of money, and also your profitability. Um, as a forwarder, we are required to retain these documents for years and years and years and years. Um, and the certificates of origin we discussed a little bit. The simple statement on company letterhead, it does not have to be a formal document. You can Google the required information needed on a certificate of origin. As long as that information is on there, it doesn't have to be on an official form. Again, depending on where you're going, some countries will require a chamber stamp, others do not. You can hand walk it to um, your local chamber of commerce and have that done yourself, or you can have your freight forwarder do it. Um, we tend to prefer to do it because we will have it chamber stamped on the city where it's actually going to depart versus where it truly originated at. Um, trade agreements, um, here, like as an example, NAFTA. Um, and I don't know yet how that's changing, but when moving freight into Canada or out of Canada, we had a NAFTA as opposed to a certificate of origin. Basically the same information is provided, but because there's a special trade agreement, a slightly different document was used. Um, and that's it, again, just documents, documents, documents. And then here talks a little bit about the export regulations. So every product that leaves the US for an overseas destination must be approved for export by the US Customs Border and Contro Border Patrol, which is a branch of Homeland Security. Also needs to be approved for the de destination country that it is going to. Um, as you see, the CBP works very closely with the Bureau of Industry and Security, um, branch of the Department of Commerce, most products leaving the U.S. are exported under a general license, meaning no license required, um, while a limited number of products do require a license. Again, your forwarder and their broker is gonna look. Um, if we see an item that we know requires a license and you are not supplying us with one, we're gonna talk. Um, so. General prohibitions. Exporting to control countries, that's a little bit about what um, we talked about earlier. Countries, Cuba, North Korea, many countries in the Middle East. There is a long list and I can email people copies of the list afterwards if you want that. Um, export of foreign made items with minimum US content. This is a little bit where we're talking about um, the certificate of origin. Um, just because it is shipping from the U.S. doesn't mean that it was necessarily made in the U.S. or made predominantly of U.S. product material. So that's going to come into the re-export and export from abroad of a foreign produced direct product of U.S. technology. How about I just skip over that one because I can't say that all. Um, engaging in actions prohibited by a denial order. Um, Exporting to, to a prohibited end user, again we talked about countries, there can also be certain companies, um, as Ken brought up, that are on a no ship to list of sorts. So that is something we're gonna look into as well. Um, exporting to an embargoed destination, we, which we discussed, <coughs> supportive proliferation activities. Um, sometimes, you're gonna see this here, 
these are countries where there is just a high volume of theft. Um, basically, containers just disappear in the middle of the night. Um, we're, not, we're not going to participate in that. Um, and then also, violations of any order or term of condition and proceeding with the transaction with knowledge of a violation. Um, you know, we have a rule in place, you can't ship to Cuba. Canada may not have that rule in place. If we know that you are moving your product to Canada with the ultimate goal of getting it into Cuba, we cannot participate in that. And we are going to strongly urge you not to participate in that and maybe have a chat with Ken or somebody else who can advise you of the penalties involved for doing so. And then products are regulated for three reasons. To protect national security, to comply with U.S. foreign policy, and to protect um, the items or resources deemed in short supply. Sometimes items can't be sold internationally because there is already a shortage of them here in this country, so we don't want um, that leaving the country when there's already a huge need for it here. Um, so, look, more controls, more documents involved. <laughs> So here's just a little overview. And again, they're going to have a printout of this. So we're not going to read through this whole thing. It is very lengthy, but you will have something to take home with you on this. Um, and again, talked a little bit here about the denied person list. As Ken and I have mentioned, not only can um, it be an issue going to certain, where you can't ship to certain countries, but can't ship to certain people within that country. That's your denied persons list. Um, this will talk a little bit about how you can find out if your potential new customer might be one of those denied persons. And then here just a little bit how we navigate freight around the world using um, all different modes of transportation depending on what your unique shipping needs are. So this is a, a lot of information and definitely as you saw there's a lot and lot of documents involved. Please as a small business who is thinking about branching into the international market, don't let this intimidate you or prevent you from moving forward. There are a lot of professionals out there, professional freight forwarders, lawyers, and stuff. We are here to help you. We want you to succeed. We want you to grow in the international market. International trade is very exciting. I have been in this industry for over 15 years. Never have I had two days that are the same. You are always learning. You are always growing. Don't be intimidated. Don't be afraid. This is what we are here for. We're going to, a good forwarder, a good lawyer, not only are we going to provide you information, but we're going to educate you. We're going to hold your hand sometimes if needed. Um, sometimes we're going to give you a stern lecture with a slap of a ruler, but that's what we're here for. We all want you to succeed and grow your small business. My company is also a small business, so um, two small businesses working together, and we can accomplish many great things. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me.